Hey y'all, and welcome back to Coding with Minmer. On today's agenda, we're gonna tackle LECO problem 1650, lowest common ancestor of a binary tree three. After that, we'll cover two actual variants of the original question that Meta asks. The first one is meant to confuse candidates, but it's very trivial, you'll see. The second variant is a bit more involved. Okay, let's get started. We're given two nodes in a binary tree, namely P and Q, like so, here they are. And we have to return what's called the LCA. As to what the LCA is, the name itself is surprisingly self-explanatory. It's the lowest ancestor that is common to both nodes P and Q. Let's take a look at some quick examples. Here we see that both nodes are in two different subtrees. The LCA then should be node 1. Put another way, node 1 is the lowest node that has both P and Q as its descendants. And while that is also true for node 0, node 0 is not the lowest node, node 1 is. Now, what if P and Q were in the same subtree? Let's move node Q to node 2. The LCA here should be actually node Q itself. Node 2 has node 4, or P as its closest descendant. And if you read this little gotcha right here in bold, a node can be a descendant of itself. That's just the rule. Okay, moving on. So if we look at the class we're given of the node, we're given the usual value pointer to the left child and pointer to the right child. But if you examine this class a little bit more, you'll see that we're also given a pointer to the parent node. Ordinarily, if you've done LCA LECO problems before, we're normally given the root node and we tend to traverse in the downwards direction. Here, we're not given the root, so we have to apply some reverse thinking. We want to traverse upwards from both nodes P and Q, or at least that's the intuition here. And I will say upfront, there is an implementation that requires extra space of big O n. But Meta will almost always ask for the optimized solution of big O 1 constant space complexity. Thus, we'll opt for that solution. Don't waste too much time explaining the brute force solution in the interview if you already know it. And as a last heads up, don't worry if you didn't figure out the optimized solution by yourself. There's a trick to it that isn't very obvious. But once you see it, you won't be able to unsee it. Okay, but how do we solve this? Let's consider our example tree on the right hand side and inspect it a little bit closer to see what observations we can make. Well, first off in this diagram, given P and Q, its LCA should be node one. We established that earlier, that much is clear. But furthermore, notice this, isn't node P to node zero, the root look like a linked list? It does, and indeed it is. Remember, we're given the parent pointer, so therefore, node 4 points to node 2, 2 to 1, and 1 to the root node 0. The same deal from our other node, node Q. It's 5 to 3, 3 points to 1, and 1 to the same root node. Thus, doesn't this question just boil down to finding the very first node intersection between our two nodes P and Q? We can write a while loop and move our two pointers along one by one, like so, until they both equal each other. And the moment they do, they must have landed on the LCA. We'll return that, and that's it. I did the first while loop iteration here already, but on the second and last iteration that we need, we move P from node 2 to node 1, let's cross that out, and we do something very similar, moving Q up one level to node 1 from 3. And here, since they both equal each other, we must have found the LCA we can return node P or Q, it doesn't matter, they both point to node 1. So node 1 is our return node. And just a little fact that will be useful for later on, both Q and P move a distance of two nodes. But is this algorithm that simple? Does this logic work for every case? Turns out it doesn't. What if we had something like this? Just for visual purposes, I've rotated a binary tree 90 degrees clockwise. So the root now is here at node 7. This may seem odd, but trust me, it'll help the explanation. Okay, let's try our same algorithm from before. So in our while loop, we move P up one parent node to node 5. We do the same thing for node Q, 1 to 2. They both don't equal each other, so let's move on. After that, we move P to 6 and Q to Three. Clearly, the two nodes don't equal each other, they're not on the same node. Let's try moving P up once more to the root and Q to node 6. Okay, so they clearly don't conveniently converge like they did before, namely at node 6, but that was because both nodes P and Q started from the same distance to the LCA. That would look something like this, but that wasn't the case. 
Here, our two nodes started at disjoint offsets. So what do we do to ensure that they both land at the LCA at the same time on the same iteration? Well, this is where the clever trick comes into play. Notice here that between the two linked lists, that Q starts with an offset of one extra node, aka this one. So it's no wonder that node P got to the root node one node faster than Q, right? As we can see here, P is at the root, Q lags one node right before. And when this happens, what we can do is compensate and restart P, which is at the root, all the way back to where Q originally was. And let's just call this something like Q start for reference. And of course, in the same iteration, you move Q up one parent as well. But what did we just do? Now, node P has an extra node to traverse on its way to the root. Okay, let's continue on in our algorithm. On the next iteration, you move P up from node one to two, and node Q, as you can see, is now at the root. And FYI, we know that node Q is at the root because there is no parent of the root node. It's simply a null. But anyway, in regards to node Q on this iteration, it had an extra node to traverse in the first place. So no wonder it'll hit the root node one iteration later than P. So similarly, when it hits the root node, we can restart its path traversal to where P originally was. No surprise, let's call it P start. And now it has one less node to traverse on its way up to the root. And as we'll soon witness, something magical happens. Let's continue our while loop as per normal. P goes from two to three, Q goes from four to five, and on the next and last iteration, we move P one last time to six, and Q to node six as well. And when you look at that, they both equal one another. Our LCA is indeed node six, the first node that we intersect. And this is all because P and Q started at the correct offsets on the second climb. Put another way, node P moved a distance of one, two, three, all the way to four on its first climb for a distance of four before being reset and traveling another one, two, three, a distance of three for a total of seven nodes that it traveled. Node Q moved a distance of one, two, three, four, five on its first climb, five like so, before being reset to node four and traveling one to another distance of two on the second traversal. And when you look at that, both of them traveled the same distance. And because they had the right offset starting points, they will arrive at the first intersection. The math indeed maths. Now remember, in this case, our answer is six. We can return either nodes Q or P. It doesn't really matter. They both point to the same memory address anyway. But in our case in the code, we'll just arbitrarily pick node P. And that's the algorithm. Okay, that was quite a lengthy explanation that isn't very proportional to the number of lines of code. I think there's only like 10, but let's do it. Okay, so first off, I'm actually gonna rename our parameters here, P to P start, Q to Q start, just to stay consistent with our diagram from before. Let's denote it here, we have P start, and we have Q start at nodes three and one respectively. And don't worry, thankfully on leecode.com, there are no static code analysis tools to enforce any naming conventions. After that, remember we have P that at first points to P start and Q that points to Q start. Let's ready those variables. Again, P to P start and Q to Q start, like so. Now recall that both pointers are gonna keep moving up in the tree one parent at a time until they eventually converge at node four, our answer here. That as long as they do not equal each other, we're gonna keep going in our while loop. So let's write that out. As long as they don't equal each other, we keep iterating. And when they do converge at node four, we can pick one or the other. I'm gonna pick node P, let's return that memory address. Now looking at our simple example here, what happens in the normal case in our while loop? Well, it's when neither pointers are at the root and we simply just move them up one pointer. So P goes to four, Q goes to two. Let's translate that into code that if you're not at the root, then you're simply going to just reassign it to the parent. Same thing for Q, that if you're not at the root, well, you're going to reassign it to the parent, moving both of them one node up. But when say a node like P is at the root, we're going to reassign it to Q start. So they start at the right offset and on the second climb, they will indeed converge at node four. So let's move it all the way here to Q start and Q not being at the root, will move up one. 
we just add an else here that p will now equal q start. Obviously, that can happen to q as well. So in that case, q will start at p start. And you see on the next iteration right here, we will do just that. They equal each other. Remember to move p as well. We go through our loop one more time. Clearly, the two nodes don't equal each other, so we move on in our while loop. But on the final iteration, p goes up one and q goes up one. Way to look at that, we return node four on line 18. And with that, that's actually the full implementation. All right, it's time to get into the first variant. All right, so I mentioned the first variant is meant to throw off candidates. What if the data type of each node is no longer an int, but rather a car or a string or anything else for that matter? Our first question becomes, what part of our implementation changes? This is a trick question because absolutely nothing changes. If you recall from our code implementation just now, we didn't once access a node's integer value. And if the type changed from an int to a car, we don't access that either. Let's reinspect our code from just now and prove that. Okay, so I typed out the class declaration of a node in pseudocode. As you can see, we have our new car field and we have the usual three pointers. Let's scan our code from top down and see what fields are in use. Clearly, we see the parent node being accessed and it makes sense. We try to climb up the tree from both P and Q. So we just check mark that field and say, hey, it's used. Looking further, that's actually pretty much it. And you'd be right, we didn't even use our right and left pointers, let alone our new car field. The point is, don't be surprised if meta gives you fields you don't need. Overall, no changes are required, fantastic. Let's move into the next variant, which I will say is a bit more substantial. Let's see what it is. The second variant requires another layer of thinking, specifically around the different inputs we're given and how we can make use of it to solve this problem. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, as inputs, we still have pointers to P and Q, as you can see here. But what if you're also given a vector, in this case, it's called nodes, of all the nodes and their memory addresses. Note here, they're unordered. In other words, they're not in any particular traversal, like in order, pre-order, etc. Here you see we have node two, five, four, one. It's completely random. Additionally, if you notice one more thing, look at our class declaration. We're no longer given the parent pointer. We now only have the left and right children of any given node. So in this tree example, how can we now return node two as the resulting LCA given these two nodes? Well, I mean, we're given a vector of nodes. Why not iterate over it? On the first iteration, we'd be on node two. And well, for each node, we realize we have access to their left and right pointers respectively, right? Can't we still implement the parent pointers ourselves? While it's true we don't explicitly have a parent pointer, can't we still represent that in an adjacency list? Let's just walk through it and I'll show you what I mean. Like I said, we're on node two in the first iteration. We first check if any children exist and indeed they do. The left child in this case does exist, it's node four. So we can insert that as a key of the child node, node four, to its parent as the value, node two. Fantastic, we look at the right child, it does exist, it's node five. Let's insert that as well, node five to node two. Let's move on in our loop. We're on node five now. And as you can see, it has a right child. It doesn't have a left one. Pay it no mind. We're not gonna insert that into our data structure then. But we do have node six. Let's reverse that relationship. Node six, the child, to its parent, node five. Indeed, that's true. You get the idea. I'll fast forward. Node four is up next, but it has no children. So we're not gonna do any sort of insertions. Node one, the root node. It has children two and three. Let's insert those. So you have node two, two, one, and three, two, one. Moving on, node three has no children. We move on, node six, same deal. It has nothing. At the end, we're left with this data structure. But here's a question I have for you. How are we so sure that the key, the child node, is unique? In other words, do we ever risk overriding the child and clobbering our map? that if we had something like this for some reason, then we'd overwrite the child of node six to node three, thereby clobbering this relationship right here with node five. But remember, thankfully in this case, we're given a binary tree. And by definition, a child in a binary tree only has one parent, six to five, three to one, 
two to one, you get the point. Otherwise, like you saw, this would be a graph and that's just not what the inputs are. Therefore, this one to one mapping does work. Once that's said and done and our data structure is built, we can reuse our previous algorithm and have P and Q climb up the tree incrementally as normal. Let's go through the workflow real quick. Node P is currently at node four, so we can reassign it to its parent, the value of node two. So node P goes up to node two. We do the same thing for Q. We look it up in our map. Well, its parent is node five. Let's assign it to node five. We do it again in the next iteration of our while loop. They both move up one. And as you notice now, node P is at the root. Like before, we need to assign P to where Q started and vice versa. But the question now is, how do we know we're at the root exactly? We don't have a parent pointer anymore to be able to say, hey, the current node we're on doesn't have a parent because its parent is null pointer, thus it's the root. So let's think about this a little bit. A node is a key in our data structure in our adjacency mapping because it's a child of another parent. And guess which node is the only node that isn't a child of another node? It's the root node, right? If there was somehow another node on top of node one, well, we'd insert that into our map as such, right? And it exists, but that is clearly not the case. Therefore, our logic is as follows. If P or Q isn't in the mapping, then it must be the root and we must restart it to, you know, the other node's initial position. Don't forget to move Q up one to node one. On the next iteration, we look at that. Q is at node one. It's not present in our adjacency list. So let's reset it to where P started, node four. Don't forget to move P. And on the final iteration of our while loop, they're both can converge at node two, like so. And node two is our answer. Honestly, I think this variant is quite fair, but it does extend a very unfair puzzle problem. So I do have mixed feelings about it being an interview question. As for the time complexity, we had to iterate over all our nodes, so it's big O n, where n is the number of nodes. As for space complexity, it's now gone from constant space to big O n. Because we had to store every single node in our mapping minus the root, so really it's n minus one, but that generalizes to just big O n. And that's it. Okay, let's implement this in code now. All right, as you may first notice, we're given another parameter here of the vector of nodes. We can use that to build our one-to-one -one mapping. Let's make it a dictionary of the child to the parent node. Let's call child to parent. It's descriptive at least. Let's iterate through each node that we're given now. And for each, we check each child that if the left child, for example, exists, then we'll create that relationship like so. Child to parent. We do the same thing on the right side for the right child, that if it exists, we're just going to create that mapping. Thankfully for us, our algo mainly stays the same thereafter, except for a few changes. Namely, remember that if our adjacency list doesn't include the current node that P or Q is on, then you must be at the root, we restart like so. That means the inverse is true, that if your mapping does contain P in this case, then you're not at the root, we move it up one parent. But remember, we don't have the parent pointer anymore. To reassign it, we'll reassign it to a value in our mapping. We're gonna do something extremely similar for Q that if it contains it in our mapping, we move it up one parent. To do that, we assign it to whatever the value was in our mapping. And with that, there you have it, that is the code. And if you learned something today, please make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.